So, um, what I want to talk tonight, it's a, like I said briefly, it's, it's a new project for me because I just finished uh, my previous project. Is it loud enough? Or do I need to speak louder? Because the previous project was about interwar era and World War II era. I was interested mostly in the relationship, I have to go to check all the time, uh, to speak. Uh, because I researched especially Jewish Gentile relationship um, in a comparative study in Moldova and part of Ukraine, which was World War II Transnistria. So now I'm working on a new project that's strictly related to the period of 1945-1953, which is called in, like, by historians like late Stalinist or high Stalinist. So I want to share with you, since like all of you having your own research projects, I want to share with you some kind of my preliminary uh, findings, uh, some of the main ideas. So at this time it's still very kind of nebulous. It's more like a, a road map of what I want to do. So I will basically uh, put this road map in front of you and I'll be happy to discuss this like road map with you. So what I want to start with, uh, you know, as any historian, you're supposed to talk a little bit about uh, the historiography. So I want to Try, I won't try to be like too complicated, but what I want to show here with this book covers, I want to make the point that basically when we talk about Jews and um, what happened to Jews, the, the history of Jews in Soviet Union, it's basically what you see here. The story of Jews is always represented as the story of what Stalin did to Jews. As you can easily see, it's all about like Stalin's last crime, Stalin's secret program, Final Politica Stalin, Stalin Project Cosmopolitan. So it feels like it's more about Stalin than about Jews. Uh, it was very like rare occasions. You do have some studies about literature, about poetry, you know, and about some kind of oral history. But in general, historiography about this period. It's, it's really significantly drawn by the history of repression and history of exclusion. So what I thought that I want to do in my project, I thought that I want to, to look at different things. I want to look at Jewish life, and I also want to see Jews also as not just objects of history, but also as like subjects of history, like people who do make history and not just like people to whom history is done. So um, I started by looking at various aspects. And um, here I sketched a little bit of kind of uh, my research agenda, what I have in mind. Uh, I thought that maybe I want to look at the social environment in Soviet Union after World War II, especially when this social environment is related to Jewish life. Uh, I said that I want to study what so-called Jewish agenda. I mean, like, what Jews were interested in, what were their priorities inside society, uh, what is happening to Jewish identity, because it's a very important time, it's time after the Holocaust, it's time when the State of Israel is created. <coughs> and this is a, a this very important historical moment for any uh, Jewish individual. And not in only inside the Union, but also actually Jews in many different other countries. And so, as you could see on this like, tiny map, I have a couple of circles that I draw on the map. It's basically, I want to explain what's going to be kind of my, my zooming territory. Since I come from Kishinev, it's only easy and kind of logical to assume that I would deal with the Jewish community from Moldova. So that's the blue circle there. Um, and it's interesting because it's a new Sovietizing territory. So in a way, it's a very different territory compared to the rest of the Soviet Union. Therefore, I have a little bit of orange circle. And I'm trying 
and I'm only like to look to get some glimpses of what's happening in neighboring Ukraine, just like a little bit for the sake of comparison to understand like how similar or different other processes uh, in core Soviet territories, territories that were Sovietized after 1917. And of course the red dot is Moscow, which means that I, I cannot study what's happening to Jews at the periphery of the Soviet state without really understanding what is the policy in the center. Um, and yes, I do want to triangulate somehow. Uh, I want to see how this relationship between states, Jews, and Gentiles, how they all shape each other. So, what are my sources? Um, I like to have different types of sources. And uh, I'm a big fan of having different types of sources. Uh, Jewish testimonies, some of them are already recorded and we have huge collections of such oral histories in various locations. Uh, uh, I do work in uh, two important archives in Kishinev. One is the National Archives and the one is this like, weird name of social political organizations. It's actually the former Communist Party archive. Uh, as you could guess, and the same applies to Urgaspi, which is also the former party archive, and Garf, the <coughs> state archive of the Russian Federation. Then there is a very interesting collection, uh, Dmitry Volkogonov's papers in the U.S. Library of Congress, uh, that he donated basically the most important, like thousands of pages of copies from various Russian archives. And um, uh, you know, the lecture is possible in collaboration with the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. And the Holocaust Memorial Museum's archives is like very unique in the sense of wealth of materials that they have, the copies that they made, including from Ukraine, all over various archives. Like for my own purpose, I studied materials from Vinitsa, Nikolaev, Odessa, and Kiel, and like Jewish anti fascist committee collection. So, I guess like for many of you, this might be a destination that's probably even easier to access with all collections in one site than like traveling to different places. So it's like something to keep in mind. Um, so, a um, couple of words about like social environment and what happened to Jews um, after World War II. Well, it's like, mm, I'd say nothing that you don't know in the sense that after World War II it was a time of destruction. Uh, it was a time of um, when physically thousands of Jews had to travel either by foot or in conditions of extreme difficulty to their previous locations. And uh, the, the first reactions was to discover that the entire families were wiped out and um, that uh, their family disappeared, mean, being killed uh, during World War II. So um, one of the decisions, like the primary decision has to be made is like, what do you do? Do you stay in the same location or you move on? And these were difficult decisions that were done. And here I like sketched a couple of points what, what I observed that's happening. First of all, because of the interesting location and the interesting prehistory, part of Jews, uh, especially from Bukovina, they are allowed to so-called repatriate to Romania. So, so for a couple of tens of thousands of Jews, for them the decision is either to stay in the Soviet state, which is a nasty state from their point of view, but the, the option is to go to Romania, which is another nasty state that just finished the Holocaust. So it's a tough decision to make, and different people make their own decision. But we do know that over 20,000 Jews like, managed to uh, so-called repatriate. And then, in addition to this, people move inside the country from one town to another one. And frequently, um, in, in survivors' testimonies, they explain that it's simply the, um, the, the environment is too charged, 
too hostile, too many things, even things that they never observed. For example, I remember that in a village, a tiny village called Korpach, a um, family of Jewish survivors from Transnistria, they came back home. And what they find, it's not the destruction, the house was there, it was empty, yes. But I think they were more traumatized, and they explicitly say it, they were traumatized by the fact that the family's best friend, a woman, she was the one who plundered the house. And she was also bragging to other neighbors that if the family is coming back, she will slaughter them, she will cut them like cabbage, she said. And then she, they also find that the local population, Gentiles, Christians, that they were the ones who drowned two other Jews who remained in the village. So for people like this Jewish family, the decision was, am I able to stay and leave and pretend that nothing happened? Uh, you know, from this day on, or uh, you just like move on and start from scratch, start from point zero, and leave everything behind and try to build a new life. So people had to make this kind of cha uh, decisions and changing of lifestyle. And this is a this is a broader story. There's a couple of examples, but this is a broader story of Jewish community and Jewish individuals making decisions. Uh, and of course, in this decision, the fact that entire networks were eradicated also had an important role to play. And then, anti-Semitism is present, and I know stories about uh, Bessarabia, or Moldova, and I know stories that apply to Ukraine as well. And um, in Bessarabia, it's a strong tradition of both pre-war era, because it was part of the Romanian state. Of course, uh, Nazi propaganda also has its own impact. But also, especially in Moldova, surprisingly, there is a new social mobility for Jews that advanced in significant numbers in uh, Soviet Moldavia. And this new social mobility uh, uh, creates a new type of anti-Semitism and additional tensions inside of Moldova. And there are a lot of uh, anonymous letters, a lot of complaints saying <coughs> that like, what's happening here now, you have a situation only when like, Jews live well and all Moldovans, you know, they're thrown out into the street, they're barefoot, they're hungry, and so on. So uh, these are additional tensions created because of new changes in, in social positions or that overlap on old feelings. Uh, a separate issue is the fight over Jewish property that also adds into this animosity. Uh, you see some examples of quotations. And this is truly just one example, and you have numerous such examples when people uh, come back and nothing is left. But also, to be fair, you know, people of different nationalities who evacuated and they came home, frequently they also found their homes empty. But what is different is that when people try to reclaim this property, in numerous cases, the Gentiles would fight back with anti-Semitic slurs and with like various anti-Semitic, you know, accusations. So uh, this somehow made Jews to think that the situation is totally different compared to pre-war era. That probably inside the Soviet society it was an anti-Semitism that was not matched before. That is the conclusion for many Jewish survivors. At the same time, I think that the, definitely the situation is more complex because um, the reality is that the fight for um, any type of housing is really fierce. Here I have some numbers from Mordechai Schuler. He estimated that between half or maybe one third of all the residential buildings in the occupied territories of the Soviet Union were destroyed. This is like a truly significant 
number. And whoever studied the period uh, uh, Soviet Union social history before 1941 would understand <coughs> how abysmal were housing conditions in Soviet Union before. So if you imagine that this space, like half of the housing is taken away, it's clear that the situation with housing is out of control. And exists a number of groups of people who all have the right, legal right, to housing. And they all fight. And the state is not able to, to find a solution to this. And here is like one example of this fight that frequently took this kind of nasty, anti-Semitic language. For example, a Jewish veteran, he sent a letter to Stalin, um, and at the same time to the Central Committee of the Moldavian Communist Party, he said that the Smersk officers occupied, occupied his house and physically and verbally abused his family. And pay attention to, to the accusations. They said that you took those little eats from the orphanage and that they would rip all little eats in two and hang them by their legs, that they insulted veteran's wife, that she bought the word of bread banner by selling her body. So, what is happening here? Well, the visible thing is that the language sounds very anti-Semitic, you know, it's like eats, little eats, and, and very aggressive. But at the same time, we do understand that it's like truly impossible to, to think that they were believing everything that they were saying. It's like, come on. Were they really <coughs> believing that the kids were from orphanage just because the family was like with many kids? Were they truly believing that the woman had the word of red banner just because she was a prostitute? I would do understand that that's probably not true. But uh, what is showing that they're throwing like nasty things and nasty words on, on people when Really, they wanted the house. And while this is just one case, it just shows you how in this kind of tensions, like many of the words that are thrown at people, maybe are not necessarily what, what people meant that to happen in reality. Um, so moving to the so-called Jewish agenda and identity, I want to uh, bring into discussion several aspects. One of these aspects is um, justice. Because I feel like the issue of justice, justice somehow did not receive sufficient attention. Because, um, especially I'm curious also, uh, you know, I always had this idea, how would people feel? You know, when they come to the villages or the cities and they discover that, I don't know, neighbors participated into the killing, would they want to take revenge or not? And um, usually this is not the topic that it's widely discussed in the literature. And I did encounter cases that indicate that actually people were interested in taking revenge <coughs> and in punishing uh, those who were guilty of uh, crimes against Jews. And there are a number of indications. Uh, first of all, it's clear that a big number of Jewish individuals uh, participated in the trials as witnesses or um, accusers. But also, uh, I'm especially interested in cases when Jewish individuals kind of undertook their own investigations. And I do have a case, for example, of a Jewish individual from a village called Pepin, who came from the army. He discovered that, you know, his entire family is killed in the village. He decides to go to Romania and to find that military guy who was in charge for organizing the massacre in Pepin. He doesn't succeed, but we know that he spent a couple of months trying to go around to his friends, spending months in their houses, and basically looking for the person who went into hiding. 
then uh, I have another example uh, that's actually from Bukovina on the territory of today is a uh, um, Ukraine in a village named Chude. There in that village of Chude, another Jewish individuals come back and also find about the mass execution of Jews and the mass plunder of Jews. And what he does, he manages to convince two witnesses uh, to actually accuse the chairman, the Soviet chairman of the village today, to accuse him of participation into looting of Jewish individual. And this chairman is put on trial and taken away. So um, there are cases like this when we see that uh, it's a certain proactive position from the side of Jewish individual. Here uh, is another um, aspect that I want to bring into discussion and I want to exemplify with this image of Pravda. I have a feeling that you probably heard about uh, because since it's about Kiev, uh, at the beginning of September 1945, it was a big incident here in Kiev that uh, in all historiography, especially in the West, is described as a pogrom. Um, so, as a result of that event, a group of um, um, Jewish war veterans wrote a letter to Stalin and wrote a letter to Prada. And I don't know if any of you had the chance to read the letter, but it's a fascinating letter. It's truly a fascinating one, because uh, also, again, the agency of Jewish individuals is astounding. Because what they do, first of all, they accuse the leadership of Ukraine. They say, the leadership of Ukraine, it's like a gang of Chernasotense. It's like the policy is like policy straight from Goebbels' office. And they said, and you know what's happening with true communists in these days? They throw their party cards, they maybe burn their party cards. That's basically no trust that the party can solve the issue. So they kind of put an ultimatum to the leadership. They say that do something about this, because if you don't do something about this, then the letter is really interesting, because it's like threatening. They say then, you know that we do have connections, that the Jewish community is very strong, coherent, and what we'll do, we'll ask the international community to react to the type of anti-Semitism that's happening in Soviet Union, and we will ask for an international tribunal. That's quite the letter. Unfortunately, we don't know what happened to them, because there is no like trace of the aftermath. But, um, the voice of the letter, and the, it's telling in itself about some of the feelings that were running high inside the country. Then uh, again, this idea of agenda and uh, identity, an important role is played after World War II, immediately after World War II, by the Jewish Anti-Fascist Committee. And that's probably one of the best known pages of the Jewish history after World War II, including because the committee uh, was persecuted and like big number of the members of the committee were killed. But what is probably less discussed, but from my point unfairly less discussed, is how this committee after World War II really believes that it has a role to protect and to promote Jewish interests. And it's really interesting how they try to, first of all, to take care uh, and write to Molotov about the fact that Jews are not helped sufficiently when they return from uh, the, the camps and ghettos. They also uh, bring up the issue of um, creating a Jewish Republic in Crimea, which shortly would turn into a really difficult problem. Uh, it's difficult to believe, but in that message, when
when they ask about like, creating a Jewish uh, Republic in Crimea, they basically <coughs> criticize the state policy uh, from Kremlin and they say that, let's face it, Birobidjan project failed. And we need to create equal conditions from Jewish people and creating a republic in Crimea would be the best for like ensuring this. And then another important point is that they are really trying to be the bridge between the Soviet Union and the West. Because this is what they did during World War II. They managed to collect over 40 million uh, US dollars for the war effort. So they want to keep to being the bridge between Soviet Union after World War II. <coughs> and they uh, sent um, messages to the Kremlin saying that we are in touch with important organizations. We I have meaningful commission with the most important businessmen and politicians in the United States, in Great Britain. This sounds wonderful in 1945. I give it like three more years and it will be horrible because the Cold War will start and all these like meaningful connections that they have with businessmen and politicians uh, would basically be like a death sentence for them. Um, so, um, I explained a little bit about uh, some kind of conflicting loyalties in the case of those who had the choice either to stay inside the Soviet Union or to leave. Uh, I have here one example to explain that even, uh, you know, the Jews who survived in Soviet Union, when they had to make an assessment of the quality of life that they were hoping to have after World War II, they could say that, like, well, life in Romania was better than the Soviet Union, according to their understanding. And uh, they were criticizing, like, this person, Samuel Goldstein, for example, he was sentenced to, to, uh, to 10 years of prison. He said that, I should admit that here in Soviet Union, uh, there is only corruption, there is extreme poverty, that uh, even doctors and engineers don't have a winter coat, and you all hold it of Parusino Tufle, Darje Zimoy. This is what he said. So, um, in his understanding, this is a very primitive material culture here, and um, he wanted back to Romania. And for this desire, Soviet Union sent him back <laughs> to Siberia. Mm -hmm. And then it was a, a difficulty being transferred from the <coughs> Communist Party into the Soviet Union. It was like numerous difficulties having these bourgeois professions that they had in interwar era. I'll be happy to, to talk more about this if you have an interest. Um, what I'm saying, because of the, this changes, or because of this agenda and transformations, also, the authorities also like start to, to pay attention, and um, uh, but but the way they pay attention is different. The the light that they view what's happening is different from the light that Jews are viewing the situation. So, for example, uh, the issue of anti-Semitism that I mentioned, like how Jewish veterans were seeing anti-Semitism. This is, in '46, one of the uh, reviews prepared by Agit Prop, a member of the communist leadership. This is what he said. Under the influence of commotions under which many Jews suffered, they are inclined to exaggerate the real scale, importance, and perspectives of anti-Semitism in democratic country, countries, Soviet Union included. So the regime is considering that, yes, there are issues, but you know what? I think the Jews were traumatized, so they do exaggerate. So they, they see it some like... Um, the whole issue with Black Book, which is probably also another better known episode from the history uh, of Jewish community in this period, 
is well known, so I won't uh, bold too much on this point. But I also want to bring another issue here because I saw all different materials that Alexandrov, who was the head of Agitpro, was receiving during the time when he had to make this decision about not allowing um, the black book. Uh, and it's interesting, and, and of course, some of you may know what he said in his decision. He said that the, the black book creates a false impression about the true character of fascism and uh, its organizations. He said that the red thread of this book is the idea that Germans looted and destroyed Jews only. The reader involuntarily may have the impression that the Germans fought against the Soviet Union only with the goal of Jewish destruction. So, what is clear, the Soviet authorities had an agenda. And that agenda was definitely not to allow this impression that Jewish destruction was the goal of the war or the goal of the Nazi attack. Um, and um, it's also important to keep in mind that the materials that Alexandra received as the head of propaganda for the purpose of selecting and deciding which information is going to be spread through various media, he was receiving tons of information about atrocities done against like various groups, uh, including prisoners of war from the entire occupied territory. And of course, the Black Book was collected by Jewish individuals. And it was like tons of information, but it was about just one particular group. So in itself, these like two projects and two agendas like collided with each other. And given that Alexander was the head, he had the upper hand. And so he basically vetoed the publication of the Black Book. Um, then a separate topic, which is actually a cluster of topics, is the really Im the importance of Cold War and how this Cold War, how this factor has a significant impact on uh, the relationship between the state and the Jews. So, uh, first of all, of course, it's about this fear of treason and uh, the fact that suddenly the Soviet Union uh, understand that uh, um, Jewish ethnicity means diaspora. And this diaspora is frequently inside the uh, capitalist countries that are involved in the Cold War. So this is a new novelty after the World War II that <coughs> totally has a significant impact on how the Soviet leadership sees uh, and perceives uh, Jewish community. Here are a couple of uh, exemplifications of concrete concerns that the state sees uh, in its own understanding seeping from the abroad. So for example, this fear that the correspondence with foreign countries is probably a channel for espionage. And yeah, the example like 1948 from Belarus Soviet Republic, where they complained that 10,000 people corresponded with the uh, uh, USA, and like three over close to 4,000 really was Palestine. In 1950, the Moldavian Soviet Republic, 55,000 corresponded with 54 countries. And, uh, and the, they were really alerted because of this uh, communication with outside countries. And you can imagine that, you know, they were communicated with relatives. And of course, they were communicating with the United States, with Canada, with Argentine. They were communicating with countries who were <coughs> family members. Um, and then um, several other episodes had the, like, added to this fear. And yeah, this is a, the symbolic episode when Golda Meir came to Moscow.
Moscow and she was mobbed by uh, 50,000 people and they were all chanting their name and like being excited she was the newly named ambassador uh, of Israel to Moscow. Uh, the Soviet state, there was, there was a clear expression of loyalty, of loyalty to a different state. This is what Kremlin understood. And uh, in a way, they were right to assume that it was an expression of warm feeling towards Israel. And uh, it's interesting that yeah, Israel understood it in the same way. It's like, it's much later. I think, yeah, uh, 10,000 shekel bill. I bet you recognize the, the scene, the photographs, right? Right here. It's clear that it's a significant moment for the Jewish community and this like uh, tie that was felt back then as still commemorated in, in a very impressive way. Um, but the, the, the bad part about this uh, warm feelings towards Israel <coughs> is that um, in Stalinist leadership, which was especially paranoid and suspicious about everybody, uh, Stalin was suspicious in the last days, including his own like inner circle, of course, this fear of espionage intensified tremendously in the last period. And uh, this was this idea that is becoming spread, and you find it in many documents uh, that were circulated uh, in the higher top personnel inside the Kremlin, that basically all various Jewish organizations are used by CIA for spying uh, purposes. And, uh, Especially when, you know, joint was uh, putting together any lists with addresses and phone numbers, uh, authorities went nuts. They were assuming that, like, definitely that's for purpose of recruiting spies. That's the given. So, um, uh, this is the perception that solidifies heavily, especially at the beginning of 1950s. And um, actually, the whole other processes that we know, and including the, you know, the cosmopolitan campaign that acquires really some anti-Semitic features at this time, and people already get the the clues that you know when you say cosmopolitan, maybe sometimes, or maybe you know, many times you mean really Jewish. And um, I could give you an example from the uh, archives in Moldova to, to see how people were trying to test the ground. What is the limit of what's allowed and what's not allowed in correspondence with the Soviet authorities? Uh, when they were trying to guess like how anti-Semitic you can be, what is the, the ground? So here is a, a, a guy who wrote in 1949 about the vice head of Soyuz Galanteria store in Kishna and complained about the abuse of his boss, presumably Jewish, Kustovsky. So he said, Comrade Kustovsky, a very healthy man, did not serve in the army. When there was fighting, he was in jail in the Far East, not quite clear for how long. I won't touch the issue of his nationality neither the nationality of his wife. But isn't it interesting? He's a very rough man. The workers enter his office with fear. A very shrewd and agile merchant, merchant who is ready to put hundreds of people in jail for his well-being, but will manage to remain clear himself. So, I guess you can see how different type of accusations, some of them very stereotypical about like what was understood that there are kind of Jewish features like shrewd, agile, that he dodged from the war, that he was in the rear when everybody was fighting, and that won't touch on his nationality, but isn't it interesting about everything? 
Luckily, in this case, like nothing compromising was was discovered on uh, Kostovsky, but there were many other cases when people started suffering because of this attitude and this kind of cleansing campaign, where a lot of ordinary people started to take the initiative and to ask their bosses to to act and find out how clean are these individuals. Um, so then. Yeah, the, the really well-known, uh, uh, infamous uh, doctor's plot that uh, luckily uh, only Stalin's death uh, was able to, to put stop to this uh, affair that like, traumatized, um, I guess, the entire Jewish community. And um, it's interesting that even in if in Soviet Moldavia, the persecutions were not as intense as in the center, but the same rumors that were already rolling uh, about, you know, that it's going to be a Jewish deportation, that, you know, that cars are prepared, trains are prepared to remove Jewish individuals, they started to circulate. So basically, it shows that the population, Jewish population, was in some kind of alert and deep concerned about like what his future is bringing to them during this uh, very dramatic period of their life. So um, what are my kind of preliminary conclusion? Um, briefly what I already said that uh, it's kind of visible the Jewish individual and organizations maybe start to fight for their rights and to fight against anti-Semitism was a kind of a new energy and that um, when the State of Israel was created, like different uh, forms of loyalty kind of galvanized and propelled Jewish identity in different directions. And it's also clear that uh, in the eyes of the Soviet authorities, this renewed energy in fighting for your own interests and for your own rights and fighting anti-Semitism. In addition to these new forms of loyalty or discovered affinities, it makes Jews in their understanding, as, it's a kind, they have a new type of visibility suddenly after World War II. And um, so because of that, what actually was one of the groups that were truly one of them are most trusted probably before the war, really become into uh, a dangerous one after World War II, unfortunately. So I hope that I was able to kind of pinpoint towards like the main steps from this like position of like from friends to enemies. And if you have any kind of questions or comments, I'll be happy to discuss them with you. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Дорогі колеги, ми маємо приблизно 10 хвилин на, де, на запитання. О, прошу ставити запитання. Мова англійська, російська і лекторка розуміє українську, але, на жаль, не розмовляє. Дякую, дуже дякую, дуже цікава лекція і дуже, ну, можна сказати, зробити комплімент, що ви брали не тільки один якийсь короткий період, я так розумів, ви і до воєнний період досліджували. Тому у мене питання, ось ви щойно сказали, що євреї були все-таки до війни більш такою trusted nation, так? Можете, ну, це, ну, звичайно, що це окрема лекція, але хоча б такий пінг зробити, дякую. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, thanks a lot for the question. Uh, it's actually a chapter from my previous book. And uh, I, I do see evidence that in the interwar era, for a number of reasons, and interestingly, after the war, but for the same reasons, like Jews, despite what's happening this in the Soviet Union, they are more trusted, but for several reasons. Of course, like after um, the revolution, October Revolution and, and Civil War, First of all, uh, Jews could not be suspected of loyalty to the previous regime because of the, the history. They, they were not suspected that they 
would love for Tsarist Russia to return. The same in Moldova. Uh, if Moldovans were suspected for some loyalties towards Romania, Jews were not suspected for loyalty. So in that, like politically, they were more trusted compared to other groups. And then also, uh, among the populations, they were one of the most literate groups. And it's the same situation in Moldova after the war. Moldovans, they, they had a, an illiteracy rate, rate of about 61%. And so they are trusted in the sense of like, they culturally and politically, there is a, and also, for example, compared to their belonging to the leftist movements or communist parties, again, it was in the Tsarist Russia they were prominent in leftist movement, but also in uh, Bessarabia, in inter war Romania. Also, the Jewish presence inside the Communist Party is probably nothing comparable to Moldovan presence. So, from this, like, different aspects, in uh, relationship or in comparison with other dominant groups, they were more trusted. And so, you see that the the government is pragmatical about this. They, they choose to be pragmatical about their decisions. But with time, the idea is that when they will educate their own cadres, the, the young people that will go through um, Soviet schools, Soviet universities, and they would have then the issue of nationality, and then it's not so important, and then also Jewish cultures can also go away and be replaced by Nazi, including Moldovans, and the time will come, but later. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much.